Welcome to uh, Face to Face, and today we're going to talk, uh, we're going to go to Peru, we're going to talk uh, about the situation in Peru with uh, uh, the political and social situation. And I'm with Eduardo Gonzalez, who is uh, uh, Peruvian, uh, between, uh, living between New York and, and Lima. So welcome to Face to Face. Uh, thank you so much for uh, accepting the invitation. And uh, maybe before we go to the heart of the issue of, of the situation, very conflicting situation in Peru right now, maybe you want to introduce yourself, give us a little bit of background of uh, who you are. Thank you so much for having me on your show, David. Um, my name is Eduardo Gonzalez. I'm a sociologist by formation, and I have worked over the last 25 years on human rights issues. I used to work for the Coalition for the Establishment of the International Criminal Court. Then I, were, uh, I went to work in the Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and then I have uh, worked on the field of transitional justice for a long time in different countries around the world. So, um, so the situation in Peru was in December 7, uh, the president tried to uh, cancel Congress or close the Congress and, 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 and so and, and producing uh, uh, some kind of destabilization politically. And so he was removed from power, uh, Pedro Castillo and uh, the vice president, the woman took, was an hour later elected the new president of uh, of Peru. Is that right, or do you want that's, to? That's correct. According to the Peruvian constitution, the president of the republic can dissolve Congress in certain conditions, which is when uh, Congress denies a vote of confidence to two different cabinets, and uh, which is a case that had not taken place in Peru. In the past, Peru has used that, uh, that instrument when Congress failed to give confidence to two different cabinets. Um, but in this case, uh, Castillo was not in that situation. Um, it looks like the day in which he took that decision, uh, there was a vote against Castillo, a vote of impeachment. And uh, everything seems to indicate that the right-wing opposition, which has a certain majority in Congress, did not have enough votes to um, to impeach Castillo because, as you can imagine, such a vote requires yeah. a supermajority. Yeah. They did not have that supermajority. However, after Castillo's announcement that he was going to uh, close Congress and uh, also intervene the judiciary, um, he basically gave his enemies the argument that they didn't have and uh, also the majority they didn't have. So he was removed by a very large uh, majority in the vote. And so, um, so that produced a, a large protest uh, after the, the the president was uh, was removed, and then the new president was uh, put in position. Indeed. I'm not sure it was elected, but he was put in position. And so, uh, and mainly, I want you to, to to talk a little bit more about the indigenous community who are playing a role, or yes, maybe we could. Do you think as the same playbook as what happened in Bolivia or what happened in, in Ecuador uh, mm -hmm. a couple yeah. of years ago or what they tried to happen in Venezuela? Do you think at the same, on the same scale politically or it's uh, a different phenomenon? Well, there are certainly some elements that are um, similar in the sense that, um, you know, uh, the Peruvian right wing is not, incredibly creative by itself. They just uh, follow both ideologically and tactically trends that they find in other countries. But it is different in the sense of the very specific uh, characteristics of Peru. Peru is not Bolivia, Peru is not uh, Ecuador, Peru is not Colombia or Chile. So it has uh, uh, specific differences. Um, one significant point in the case of Peru is the absolute destruction of the political system. The political system of representation uh, is now populated by parties that are simply electoral devices and uh, that do not have a direct um, interest representation from classes or sectors of class. They are full of um, pretty opportunistic sectors, to be honest. And in Congress, more than the uh, 
fractions of parties, you see fractions of specific economic interests, uh, such as the illegal businesses and, um, and some mafias that are present in Congress. And the election in which Castillo won was not an exception. Um, it was a, uh, an election in which Castillo won as a result of the extreme dispersion of the vote. During the first round, Castillo obtained 16% of the valid vote, which was a little bit over 12% of the total vote. And the second uh, candidate, Keiko Fujimori, got 13% of the valid vote. That is, both Castillo and Fujimori, who passed to the second round, uh, among themselves were not even a third of the valid vote. Wow. Right. So it was this extreme dispersion which resulted in the situation that we uh, end up yeah. having. Now, uh, because interests are not really represented in such a political um, scene, what is represented is identities. Right. So Castillo represented symbolically something. It doesn't mean that he represented it in a programmatic manner. Right. In fact, the government of Castillo was programmatically very ambiguous. Um, it did not really implement uh, many progressive measures. There were a couple of, of, of cases of progressive measures, but mostly it was a very um, um, a status quo government. In fact, the day he declared his intention to close Congress, he announced in that particular speech that he would maintain the economic model. And he used those words, right? He said that the economic model during his emergency uh, government would be uh, the same economic model that existed and he wanted to give guarantees to the economic powers that be. So, um, having um, that situation, uh, the, the indigenous community mm -hmm. took more or less over the street for yes. the last months and have been facing lot of military and police violence, a lot of death. Uh, and it's something similar who happened in Equator. It's something similar who happened in Bolivia. So uh, this is part of a new phenomena or this is something who is very specific to Peru? Well, um, what is specific of Peru is that um, in our country, differently from Ecuador and Bolivia, the indigenous movement typically has not organized on the basis of cultural identity. That is, um, you don't have too many movements that claim themselves to be indigenous. More um, accurately, they describe themselves on the basis of class. So, which is why the terms and the terminology, the ideology that you use to organize those organizations are is the campesino um, uh, social uh, identity. Yeah. So the communities that are indigenous communities are called campesino communities. The indigenous organizations are called campesino organizations, etc. What is common, though, is that, and what is similar, though, is that these communities have a very old ancestral form of organization, and therefore um, they can take collective action in very effective ways. And after Castillo's demotion, um, because of this um, symbolic identification with Castillo and because of the anger at the fact that Castillo really didn't have a, a chance to govern effectively due to the opposition in Congress and due to the opposition in the right-wing dominated press, uh, yes, indeed, there were very, very uh, significant mobilizations which maintain themselves until today. Uh, perhaps at the beginning they were more spontaneous, uh, only now we are starting to see a bit more of coordination among these uh, mobilizations. There is some role now by the uh, national uh, workers' unions and uh, some of the political organizations from the left side of the spectrum. But at the very beginning, it was mostly, as you said, the indigenous communities, the Andean indigenous communities specifically. And it was a reaction to the situation. So. Um, um, how, from, from, from your point of view, um, what, is this, what is the future now of, and, you know, it's as good as we can get, but um, uh, how do you see uh, uh, the, the situation um, progressing uh, in, and, and what are the political uh, steps who should be, who should be, who should, who should come? Yes. Well, um, it's clear that the government uh, led by Boluarte and the right wing in Congress 
uh, uh, does not see itself as a transitional government. They see themselves as a government that wants to obtain certain political objectives, right? They are uh, trying to pass legislation, for example, to change the electoral authorities, to change the ombudsman office, and, uh, and, and legislation that is pretty much programmatic for the right wing. Uh, and therefore, they are not contemplating living in the immediate sense. When they were forced to admit uh, early elections, they postponed those early elections to 2024. Uh, with the excuse that there would be some electoral uh, reforms that were necessary. On the other side, the protests are also um, uncompromising in the sense that the protests are demanding that uh, Boluarte resigns and that Congress is dissolved um, and uh, new elections are held. Uh, then some of the protests also focus on uh, the possibility of a new constitution. It is perhaps important to indicate that uh, the protests seem to be no longer about Castillo, right? I don't see or I haven't seen uh, many protests that are calling to restitute Castillo in power. On the contrary, the, the protests are centering, centering themselves on to the removal of Boluarte and new elections. Um, so the positions are quite uh, separate and I don't see any possibility of negotiation there. And um, so basically we are at a moment of force who demonstrates more resolution and force in their positions. The government, I think, is making a very cynical calculation, a very inhumane calculation, which is that the killings outside of Lima are going to be tolerated by the uh, population in Lima, by public opinion, by the middle classes, and that uh, if the repression happens in Lima, it would be more complicated for them to keep power. But in the measure that uh, the killings are happening outside, that they are happening against indigenous communities, etc., those are killings that are easier for them to justify in this very cynical and brutal way. So uh, it all depends on whether the um, coming demonstrations, which will continue in the South, are able to expand uh, around the country and particularly in the capital, uh, Lima. That would determine the sustainability of this government. But the, the, uh, what you describe as a, a, a permanent discrimination against the uh, indigenous community was not specific to, to Peru. Uh, we saw him in, in many, many different places. And the immigration to, to the north come also from that same community. So how do you, how, how can South America work on this uh, discrimination against the indigenous community? What, what, what are the, the developments? Who, who, on the same time, this community gets strength more or less every day. So it's, um, it's becoming this, uh, this as, as the community gets strength, the discrimination gets also uh, increasing, no? Yes, it is a structural situation. I mean, the situation of, of uh, indigenous communities and some countries of South America, Afro-Colombia and Afro-Brazilian communities um, is um, a, a structural situation derived from colonial structures and, uh, and they result in uh, very well-seated, deep-seated uh, patterns of racism. So the transformation of such a situation cannot depend only on political measures. So one step forward would be, at, in the political level, the question of recognizing the multicultural character or the multi plurinational character of our uh, countries, such as happens in the Constitution of Bolivia, for example. Yeah. But the constitutional change is only part of that transformation. There needs to be also mechanisms of uh, economic empowerment. Currently, uh, indigenous populations in Peru or um, elsewhere in Latin America have a very little opportunity to decide on the use of their territories, for example, and uh, all the mechanisms to consult indigenous communities about uh, the use of the territory for extractive industries are typically underutilized or deformed. So, um, and then of course there is a cultural factor which um, focuses on invisibilizing indigenous communities in countries such as Chile or Argentina, or uh, stigmatizing these communities in, in other countries. The result is, is brutal and is fatal for indigenous communities in places like Colombia, for example. The recent Truth Commission has found 
that um, the majority of the conflict has been fought in indigenous territories and Afro-Colombian territories. So uh, yes, I do agree that the situation of indigenous communities is structurally unfair because of colonial structures, and that a transformation of that would require not just political uh, measures, but also economic and cultural. So, um, and I think we can we can keep that issue at the, for our next uh, interview later on because it's a lot of to talk about this. Uh, just to to close, um, how do you uh, see the next couple of weeks or months, um, and and um, and what will be um, the the contribution then other country in South America? Well, I think we are going to have a simmering crisis. It's going to continue and it's going to depend on who demonstrates more um, resolve in order to continue either the mobilization on the one side or the repression on the other. I mean, what happens is in Latin America, I, I think we will agree that in the last 10 to 15 years, we have seen many demonstrations all over the place, massive demonstrations in all places for different reasons, corruption, democracy, security, uh, economic issues, etc. And um, regrettably, the lesson learned is that if a government kills and shoots and mobilizes, um, uh, you know, paramilitary organizations, uh, they keep in power. If they don't don't care about international condemnation, and we have the recent case of Nicaragua in 2018, if they don't care about international condemnation, they just stay in power, right? And so. The question is, will Boluarte follow that route, the route of being an international pariah? I don't know. I hope not. Um, I was hoping that the pressure would uh, make their resolve waver, but the reality is that yesterday Boluarte appeared on national TV to indicate that she was not going to quit and to blame the protesters, actually, and to blame uh, an, an absurd uh, conspiracy theory of international uh, actors behind the protests. So the question is who keeps the resolve and who blinks first? And that will depend obviously of the intensity of the demonstration, which I don't think is going to waver in the south of the country, but uh, it will depend a lot on what happens in the capital. To close, what are the other countries of South America, and I'm thinking about Brazil and so on and so forth, could play in that game? Well, I do think that um, for starters, there should be a strong demonstration of solidarity with the people in Peru in practical ways. For example, most of the countries of South America are members of the International Criminal Court, as Peru is. And it is perfectly possible for those countries to refer the case of Peru to the prosecutor of the ICC in order to investigate the crimes against humanity that are taking place in Peru. Another thing would be to block the sale or the sale of um, police armament to Peru. Uh, for example, just two, three days ago, Peru ordered uh, the sale of about, well, 29,000 uh, cartridges of tear gas to a Brazilian firm. And uh, it would be perfectly appropriate, I think, for the Brazilian government to impose an embargo that sure. kind of yeah. that kind of sales, yeah. right? Uh, Peru's uh, police in general, all of Latin American police buys uh, armament to Brazil and to Spain, right? So I do think that in the, in the case of Peru, this should be completely forbidden and as a mechanism of concrete solidarity with the people of Peru. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Uh, I'm, we, we will meet again. We will talk about okay, yes. uh, Colombia. We will talk about other uh, transi transitional justice. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, um, we talk very soon. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was your show Face to Face. And please keep watching your news on Presenza.com. And uh, up to see you very soon. Thank you.